Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube where we talk about business, we talk about growth, we talk about leadership and everything that matters in life. Today, it's a bit different. I didn't choose a certain topic to talk about, but if you follow on my Instagram, if you don't, please go and follow my Instagram where I share different insights. I chose to do a masterclass where I attend to most of the question that I saw that caught my interest. That's what I'm going to be doing today and maybe if you find this fun and insightful, let's do more of this, okay? Let me know what we should do. Okay, so let's start. The first question is from David who asked, I just finished my college. Should I follow the career of academic or choose what I love? Okay, now I believe this is something that we've all wrestled with at a point in time where we were trying to make sense of what we should do next, right? Should we do what we do best? Should we do what we love? Should we do what we are, what pays the most? And this is kind of a puzzle, right? Which most of us find it really, really hard to solve. And this is how I see this. Let me share with you a story uh, of Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs, you know the story. Apple founder, right, with, alongside with his co-founder, Steve Posiniak. So Steve saw an opportunity around tech and he built this, he didn't build it, he brought the idea and Vosniak was actually the one who built the computer, right? Steve was more of a business person, he went out to find deals. Now, long story short, this thing ended up working and this is what he had to say. What he said is, Actually, you don't have to love what you do. In most cases, we don't start with what we love. We love with what we do, right? And this is ironic. And the main thought here is, if you actually do something and then it becomes successful, there is no way you cannot love it, if that makes sense, right? And the puzzle right here is not even if you should choose or not. The puzzle is what, is, what is it actually you should be saying yes to? And I have a mental model that I want to share with you, David. And the mental model goes like, when you're starting out, you don't necessarily know what you're able to do. You don't even know sometimes what you love or what you love doesn't pay, right? Some of you love food and swimming and playing hockey and everything. And that doesn't pay the bills, right? At the end of the day, you need to find that something that the market can pay for, right? And you may not know what is it that you are able to do. What is the market able to reward you for? What you should use is this mental model. And this is how, how it goes. It says, at the start, you should say yes to everything that comes your way until you get to a level where you cannot afford to say yes to most of the things, right? So when you talk to most successful people, they will tell you, you need to pick one thing and focus and follow it until you become successful. But let me turn the tables around here. That is not how they started and that is how you should not start, right? So when you're starting out, I believe you should, there are more opportunities out here. What you should be doing is to look for those opportunities. And in some cases, you should wait for them to find you. Because sometimes you choose what you do, sometimes it chooses you, right? So it's not always about making choice. As much as I would love to tap in this bravado of saying that we are in control of our lives or we, our life is what we make it and everything that we hear, that is not necessarily true. You can choose something and it doesn't choose you back. And that is a reality, right? And let me give you an example. You can choose to show up in a meeting at the time, right? Let's say the meeting is at six and you choose to leave your place at five and you have maybe 30 minutes to get there. And on your way to the meeting, a hit, you know, you get hit by a car or something happens and you, you're late to the meeting. Did, did, did that mean that you didn't choose to be on time? Did it mean that you didn't do what you should do? So the irony of life is you can do everything you ought to do and it doesn't work out perfectly fine. And as long as you don't understand and make peace with this principle, you'll struggle with, with life. You don't necessarily get what you, what you put in life, right? Sometimes life has to choose what to offer to you, not what you deserve, right? And just to this question of career, 
One thing that you really need to understand as far as choosing a career is concerned, you really need to look out for those opportunities and find something. And at the end of the day, it may end up choosing you. Let me close this question with this insight. I got it from an interview I watched of Bishop T.D. Jakes. So T.D. Jakes said, when you are sprinting after something, right? You may end up not getting that thing but that thing becomes a way of you getting something else, right? So, and I believe that this should be a thought process that we use every day. What, what you're doing right now, it may not be the thing, but it may lead you to the thing that will be the thing, if that makes sense, right? So, David, whatever you studied in college, don't let it hinder opportunities around find opportunities say yes to everything regardless of what it may mean it may not turn out to be the best thing that you do but it might lead you to something that becomes a thing for you right cool second question is from jenny i would like to be a public speaker but i don't have a clue where to start from any advice now i have been in public speaking for let me six seven years now and I, as much as I would love to say I fear this thing, it was not my reality. So I, I'm kind of innately a public speaker. I did that way back when I was, since I was like 11, I used to go and I was very comfortably speaking to larger audience and like more people. However, I'm not saying that I was born a public speaker. I was born with at least that gift. I can see that I can speak, right? And there are more things that, that I had to work on over time that I can become eloquent, articulate, and confident as I am today. And I believe the first thing you should work on, most of you are, are not exactly afraid to speak. Most of you, you're not confident that you have actually something worth saying, right? One thing I'm, I know for sure is that confidence is a byproduct of knowledge. When you know what you're talking about, it's pretty much easy to become confident. Like, for instance, if I ask you, what is one plus one? You can confidently say that it's mathematically two, right? Because you know that's mathematically true, right? And a lot of you, when you struggle with public speaking, it's not exactly that your problem is public speaking. Your problem is the content. Your problem is what should you be talking about in the first place? And I find this in many occasions, right? Even for those of you who label them as introverts, there are some certain topics where maybe it's football, you're an enthusiast into matches, right? And when there is a certain subject, you seem to become extroverted, right? And that shows you that when you, when you have content, when you have knowledge about a certain topic, it's, ve it's very easy to become confident and talk about it openly, right? So my advice should you, uh, first, you should work on your content. What is it that you want to share with the world, right? Because one thing you should know is that you don't just have to speak you have to have something worth talking about so that people can make sense of attending to you, right? Second, if you can, join public speaking clubs. Personally, I do with Toastmasters Club and you can do the same. You can find other clubs where you find a safe group where you can easily share your thoughts with people around you and this will be super easy for you, right? So I hope that that's helpful. The third question is, how can I get funds to start my business? I have approached many investors without luck. Okay, so here's the thing. One thing I've, I've seen a lot of small or let me say startup, startup entrepreneurs do is to think that before you start a business, you need investment. That's very much like saying before you go on a date, you need to be good looking because I know a lot of not good looking people are married, right? So we can say pretty much the same in business. In business, in order to start a business, what you need is not investment. What you need to start a business is a customer, right? I would, I would actually say that the first investor is a customer because a customer validates the concept and a, an investor accelerates the growth of that concept, right? You will never ever meet a person who is investing in an idea well there are some you know vcs that does that like uh, the precedes but they're very very 
on, on a low scale, right? What you should, most of you, what you should be doing is to take the idea you have and you find a proof of concept of that. You validate it through customers, right? So the more the customers pay for that idea, the more you can afford to put it on a level where it's actually investable for an investor, right? Because one thing you need to know about investors is that as much as you're looking for opportunities, they are too, right? And what they're looking for is a vehicle that has much more return than the rest. And you should make your business attractable to investors so that can make sense of actually investing in your business. So if you're looking for funds to start a business, you're looking in the wrong place. You don't need funds to, to start a business. You need funds to grow a business. Okay. So go out, validate your concept, find customers, iterate on that and make it have a proof of concept of that. And you'll pretty much easily secure investors in your business. The fourth question is, how can I increase my sales? Right, this question is very generic, right? But I'll, let me also try to give you a generic answer to that. I actually think that the best way to solve problems is to solve them from the end to the start, not start to the end. So let me make this clear. If you're trying to fix sales for your company, I believe the best way you should to, to approach that situation is to, to start with fixing the retention rate, right? And then walk your way back to acquisition of customers. And the reason why that becomes very important is because when you fix the end, then you can make the most return on the, on the start of the funnel, if that makes sense. So for instance, if you have a website, before you start worrying about conversion rates, Right, you should start, you you should you know worry about uh, about the traffic you're getting because if you get a lot of traffic and your conversion is not well fixed, then you're not making the most return on the traffic you're getting. If that makes sense, right? So any problem you're kind you're kind currently wrestling with, you should try to reason backwards, right? So detectives and police officers know this best. Police officers, when they get on, on, on a crime scene, they try to do, um, you know, this process where they say, okay, I have a body lying here on the ground. What could be the scenarios? How did this start for this body to, to be lying down here? So they, they walk their way backwards until they get to the, you know, to the suspect. And that's how I believe we should be thinking. We should be reasoning backwards. So it's, it's a concept of what would need to be true for this end to be correct. So when you start from there, you can pretty much easily understand how to fix the problems. And this is what I love about this. The concept of reasoning backwards, you can actually fix the way all the way through so that when you start taking activities, you can make the most out of that, right? Next question is, I want to go to college to learn marketing. What's your advice? Right, okay, interesting. I believe I'm an enthusiast in marketing, so I'm happy that you are considering that. Let me give you a short, maybe I can even save you a few thousand dollars for college if you wanna pursue marketing. Marketing is about three things. It's about a product, it's about a customer, it's about results, three things. A customer, a product, and result. A customer is this person who is one step away from failing, whatever the situation might be. It might be in skincare, it might be in body weight, it might be in business, it might be in fashion, it might be anything, right? They're just one step away from failure. Things are not working out for them. So picture that person who is in a worse in the worst possible scenario and have that picture in mind. How did that, that person look like? What keeps them awake at night? What makes them lose their mind and go nuts? What is their problem? And figure that persona and capture that. That's the first thing. Second thing, a product. How does this offer come to rescue to this person we just pictured in mind? How do, does this product solve the problem how does this service bridge the gap between where the, the person is at and where they want to go right and result is what's the final picture of this person after using this product what is that 
picture. How does it look like? And marketing is simply a work of taking. Most people, what they do wrong is they talk about themselves or they talk about the product. Our company is amazing. We do X, Y, Z. Our product does this. And nobody gives a shit. Marketing is the art of talking to that person and let them see a different state after using the product. Because nobody cares about your product, but everybody cares about what the product can do for them. They care about them making progress. If you want to understand the art of marketing, you need to figure out how to tell stories that bridge the gap between where people are and what they can be with using your services. That's marketing, right? And at the utmost level, I'll say, there is a great saying on poetry that poetry is about making new things familiar and familiar things new. And that should be also the same language for marketing. Marketing is mostly making things less weird, right? Things that we considered abnormal, they can be normal through marketing. Let's say, for instance, how many of you have actually entertained or even bought the shoes that Kanye West wore of Balenciaga? I mean, <laughs> that's a huge kind of shoe, right? But because Kanye made it normal, then we can make sense of buying something that was unlikely to be bought in the first place. So the work of marketing is to make things that less weird right and to help the adoption process to bridge the gap using stories that appeal to people so if you understand those three metrics you've nailed marketing i would even confidently say you don't need to go to college understand who's the customer what is their state what is the product how does it bridge the gap and what is the actual result if you can communicate those articulate you are a marketer period let me have this as maybe the last. I have a business. I'm exploring on ways to build its brand. What's your take? Right. Branding is a complex subject and maybe I can do like a, a detailed video about branding, but let me just say this. Our mind is more optimized on reducing the risk than adding on the advantage. So when we're trying to make decision, we're trying to take the less risky alternative, not, in, not the most ROI possible alternative, if that makes sense. So I don't think people buy brand A over brand B because it's necessarily better. I think people buy a brand because it's, it's likely to be less bad. Right? So when people are buying things, they don't buy things that are better. They buy things that are not bad, if that makes sense. So the work of a brand is to help people reduce anxiety over, should I buy this? Am I certain that this is not going to turn out the worst thing? So because there, there, is, there is a mental model called heuristics. And heuristics are a set of ideas that runs our minds unconsciously and they make most of the decisions that we think we do. And one of the heuristics we have as people is you don't buy things you've never heard of, right? So if you work in a supermarket and you see two brands, you are more likely to buy the brand you've seen over the brand you have not seen. And the reason is not that the brand you've seen is the much better one. The reason why you buy the brand you've seen and you know is because it is likely to not be bad. You, don't, you are not looking for the best thing. You're looking for the thing that is not going to be bad, right? And that's the work of a brand. The work of a brand is to familiarize us with, with, with products so that we can easily make sense in purchasing decision. Because the strength of a brand is determined by the readiness with which a brand comes to mind when a person is making purchasing decisions, right? So I believe that's the best thing you should be investing in. And the reason why branding does not take off is because it's got an effective mindset in an efficient culture. Because business, what looks for is the efficient way to do things, is the costless way to do things. Branding is not quantifiable. You cannot quantify the return on investment on, on building a brand. But over time, that's where you can see the ROI, right? And I believe we can take this for now. 
and i've enjoyed uh, attending to your question if you have some of them shoot them go to my instagram and send me your dm i'll try to attend to most of them as i can thank you for keeping up with this channel thank you for subscribing sharing and commenting let's go cheers